Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, you can hear me because you're sitting right there. <laughs> Tonight is our uh, last night on uh, putting on the whole armor of God. Um, lesson number 11. Usually have 13 and a quarter, but we got 11 in this quarter. So uh, we hope uh, that you've enjoyed these lessons. Uh, I think uh, studying this kind of, this scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, I think we probably need to do that ever so often because it uh, helps us to understand what we need to do as, as Christians to, uh, to please our Heavenly Father. And I'm calling the lesson tonight, Odds and Ends. Some things that I wasn't able to talk about earlier, and a few things that we may have talked about, but I want to talk about them again because they were so important. We'll see how far we get. Uh, by the way, uh, it was uh, eight radiation days ago, and for those that are not taking radiation, it's been two weeks. But that's, since Sarah's been going to radiation, I count days in, in radiation days. <laughs> but anyway, uh, two weeks ago, um, Paul Jones uh, gave me a, a little, can you see this? It's a coin, a large coin. Well, maybe you can see it if I do this. <laughs> I put it on the screen. It's a... Uh, it's a coin about the armor of God. And you see at the top on the left, it talks about the helmet. And you go to the right about the shield and the loins and the feet and the sword and the breastplate. And on the right-hand side, it says, put on the whole armor of God, pray always. And I, I'm really thankful for that. That's a nice little coin there, especially considering what we're studying. And I, I appreciate the gift of that. And I guess Cherie help to you a little bit without to buy it. Yeah, okay. But I appreciate it very much. If you want one, Cherie can tell you where to get it. <laughs> okay, T tonight is our last lesson, as we mentioned. Um, and I'm not going to look at giving you a summary of all the things we've studied in the last 10 weeks, but uh, we're going to look at some odds and ends, like I mentioned, concerning the armor of God. And some of the information, a lot of the information, will be new. And some will be uh, reiterating some points I consider important that we've already talked about a little bit. Um, so in, in previous lessons, this is the things we've talked about, the armor of God. We talked about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and all these things are supplemented by prayer and watchfulness. And we've, we've stressed the importance that each Christian soldier needs to take up and put on the whole armor of God, not just a few of the pieces, but take up the whole armor of God. And that would be for the purpose of defending himself from the attacks of Satan and also to be offense, uh, our attacks, attack Satan in an offensive manner as well. And this ongoing conflict would certainly be described as a personal war, one that each individual Christian must conduct with the strength that comes from God against a very powerful adversary in the devil. And 2 Corinthians 5 and verse, verse 10 teaches us that we are personally and individually accountable to God for the manner in which we live our lives. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, that being said, I would have you to know that each Christian 
is not standing alone in this spiritual war. Not only are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit standing with us, they're providing the armor that we need. They're um, giving us the weapon, weapons that we need, especially the Word of God. And they're giving us the direction that we need as well. But Christians, in a collective sense, the church, we're standing together. We're not individuals necessarily. We stand before God individually, but we're helping one another out collectively. We're standing together to defend one another as the need arises. So Galatians 6, 2 talks about it as in terms of a collective war. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For just a few moments, let's return to the analogy of the Roman soldier, which we've used each week, and the use of the shield, the shield of faith. You know, when Roman legions laid siege to a fortified city or an encampment, they would sometimes employ a formation known as testudo, which is known as tortoise, tortoise formation. Hope you can see that okay. Now this tortoise formation was used in cases where they expected to be meeting the violent resistance of hostile weapons. And in some cases, the formation might be used by uh, the legions of, of Roman soldiers as they retreated to reduce the number of casualties. Now to form the testudo, the soldiers in the front rank or row walked closely beside each other and protected themselves and those behind them with a shield. And so it became a collective shield, um, which would be protecting the whole um, squad or whatever you want to call that number of soldiers together. Now the soldiers in the rear ranks then, they would raise their shields above their heads in an overlapping manner. And in this way, they produced an artificial roof which protected the leg legions against the javelins that were being thrown, the spears, and in particular, the arrows. Now the success of this formation depended upon everybody working together, all the soldiers working together. And so, that they needed to avoid gaps between any of those, those shields. And by uh, avoiding those gaps, they became barriers and prevented them from losing their lives as they approached a battle. Now, after entering this uh, tortoise formation, the legion of soldiers would begin to march in unison toward the opposing forces. And when the soldiers marched together, marched together like this, it allowed them to march right up against the enemy with, with, uh, without any, losing any of their soldiers as casualties. And then they could begin the close combat with the enemy. They could move right up, not lose any of their soldiers, and begin their close combat. And they were generally much stronger. Their weapons were better. They were better trained. And so if they got close enough in close combat situations, they were probably going to win. You know, in the same way, when God's people, the church, we might say the congregation here at Tanner, when, when we march in unison and walk with each other, we're not going to only help to protect one another from Satan's attacks, we're also going to make advances like they did into enemies, the enemy's territory. Our faith, when combined with the faith of others, can make significant gains against our enemy. That's why our enemy attacks the, the church with such vigor, because he only needs to get one or two of the shields of faith to fail for him to penetrate the defensive of the collective group of people, the church. And then he can penetrate our defenses and sometimes can cause significant damage. 
So, each Christian needs the shield of faith to protect him or her individually from the fiery darts. And in addition, we need to use the shield of faith to assist our brothers and sisters in Christ in deflecting the fiery darts that are hurled at them as well. And we do that, like the scripture says, by helping to bear their burdens, by assisting them in their times of need, making sure that their faith does not waver. And you know, when, when we're helping somebody else, make, making sure that their faith doesn't waver, I think that helps us to be sure that our faith is not wavering as well. This next section, anybody got a question on the uh, tortoise formation or anything we've just talked about? Like I said, we got some odds and ends we're going to be talking about, so we're going to go to a little bit different subject. Let's talk about the, the paradox of trials and sufferings. You know, it goes without saying that uh, we need to maintain our shield of faith with utmost care in order to block and to extinguish the flaming arrows that Satan sends in our direction. Our spiritual adversary, the devil, he uses the flames, the flaming arrows. And I'm not trying to get into your lessons, Mark, but he uses the flaming arrows of doubt, of persecution, of suffering, of fear. And in all, those, uh, and in all these things, he's doing it in hopes of defeating us. But be fully aware that our Lord can take these arrows that are being slung at us and he can use them to our benefit if we will let him. He can make them work together for our good. Remember that scripture in Romans 8 and verse 28? He can take the things that are happening to us and make them work together for our good. He can make us to be more prepared as his soldiers and better equipped to fight our spiritual battles. 1 Peter 1, 5 through 7 it reminds us of this wonderful truth. It says, who, talking about Christians, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's talking about the victory that we have, even though we are tested by various trials. What a great God we do have. He takes the powerful attacks of Satan, and he uses them to strengthen our faith to make us holy, especially when we're able to defeat him with that sword of the spirit that we've talked so much about. Even when the flaming arrows embeds itself in our shield of faith, a flaming arrow, but if our shield of faith is saturated with the word of God, you know, there's no need to panic because that flame will be extinguished. It will certainly not harm our eternal life. Any comments on that little section? Yeah. Do you think Satan also uses our successes? Do what? He can use our successes against it, us, right? Sure. He can go the other way with it. We have to be strong enough to to uh, avoid that. Okay. Any other comments? We just need to be saturated in that word of God. Our, our shield of faith needs to be saturated. Okay, I got a lesson here from, from Rome. We, all, we sometimes talk about how great Rome was, and then we talk about the fall of Rome as well. And this, is, this one is talking about the reason why the armies of Rome were so 
so great, why they were almost undefeatable. And this comes from uh, Flavius Josephus, who was a first century historian, and most of us are familiar with his writings. In his youth, youth, he was a Jewish priest and a Jewish general during the first Jewish-Roman War that resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And ironically, after that war, he became a Roman citizen and he traveled with the legions of Roman soldiers during their conquest of other nations. So Flavius Josephus lived during the zenith of the Roman military dominance at the very height of their dominance. And I want you to listen to some, some comments that he made concerning the Roman soldier. And we're talking about the height of the Roman Empire. And from Josephus, the Jewish War, Book 3, Chapter 5, he says this. Every soldier is every day exercised, and that with great diligence, as if it were in time of war, which is the reason why they bear the fatigues of battle so easily. And he continues in that same book a little bit later by saying this. And this is a long reading, but pay attention. I think it's worthwhile. This vast empire of theirs has come to them as the prize of valor and not as a gift of fortune. For their nation does not wait for the outbreak of war to give men their first lesson in arms. They do not sit with folded hands in peacetime only to put them in motion in the hour of need. On the contrary, as though they had been born with weapons in hand, they never have a truce from training, never wait for emergencies to arise. Moreover, their peace maneuvers are no less strenuous than veritable warfare. Each soldier daily throws all his energy into his drill as though he were in action. Hence that perfect ease with which they sustain the shock of battle. No confusion breaks their customary formation. No panic paralyzes. No fatigue exhausts them. And as their opponents cannot match these qualities, victory is the invariable and certain consequence. Indeed, it would not be wrong to describe their maneuvers as bloodless combats and their combats as bloodthirsty maneuvers. By their military exercises, the Romans instill into their soldiers fortitude, not only of body, but also of soul. Fear, too, plays its part in their training, for they have laws which punish with death, not merely desertion from the ranks, but even a slight neglect of duty. And their generals are held in even greater awe than the laws. This perfect discipline makes the army an ornament of peacetime and in war welds the whole into a single body. So compact are their ranks, so alert their movements in wheeling to right or left, so quick their ears for orders, their eyes for signals, their hands to act upon them. So we see from Josephus, He's talking about the Romans and, and how adept they were at using their weapons to their advantage in their battles because of how well they were trained. They continued their training every day. They did not, avoid, they did not uh, skip days. They continued every day. And that's why they were the most powerful military force of their time for sure. If only Christians could become as familiar with our weapons and as if we could just train as hard as the Roman uh, soldier did, then maybe we could be just as effective in the church as the Roman army was in warfare. Acts 17 and verse 11, it describes the city of Berea. And it says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, 
and that they receive the word with all readiness, as opposed to the Thessalonians, which apparently did not. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were diligent at working on their training as Christian soldiers. They made sure that what was being said to them come from the scriptures and that those things were so. That's what we need to do today as well. Okay, lesson number two from Rome. We talked about how powerful their armies were. Now we're going to talk a little bit about why they fell, what happened to them, what brought about their military downfall, which resulted in the downfall of Rome itself. Yeah. Was it late in the? Uh, huh? Was it late in the, the reign of the Romans, or if it was later, it might have been because of what we're fixing to study right and talk about right now. So, what brought about Romans' military downfall? Nearly all his historians agree that Rome brought about its own downfall. And listen to an excerpt from Edward Gibbon uh, in the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And there's some big words in here that you will not necessarily know what they mean, probably old English words. And when, that, when I come to one of those words, instead of saying that word, I'm gonna give you the meaning of it. I'm just gonna throw the meaning out there where you don't have to guess what it's talking about. And this is, uh, Volume 3 of that book, pages 271 and 272. <clears throat> it is the just and important observation of Veg Vegetius that the, arm that the infantry was invariably covered with defensive armor. From the foundation of the city to the reign of the emperor, uh, emperor Gratia, the relaxation of discipline and the disuse of exercise rendered the soldiers less able and less willing to support the fatigues of the service. They complained of the weight of the armor, which they seldom wore, and they successively obtained the permission of laying aside both their armor breastplate and their helmets. The heavy weapons of their ancestors, the short sword, and the formidable javelin, which had subdued the world, insensibly dropped from their feeble hands. As the use of the shield is incompatible with that of the bow, they reluctantly marched into the field, condemned to suffer either the pain of wounds or the disgrace of flight, and always disposed to prefer the more shameful alternative. The cavalry of the Goths, and the Huns and the Eleni had felt the benefits and adopted the use of defensive armor. And as they excelled in the management of missile weapons, they easily overwhelmed the naked and trembling legions whose heads and breasts were exposed without defense to the arrows of the bar barbarians. The loss of armies, the destruction of cities, and the dishonor of the Roman name ineffectually solicited the successors of Gratia to restore the helmets and the armor breastplate to the infantry. The vigorous soldiers abandoned their own and the public defense and lacking courage and being lazy may be considered as the immediate cause of the downfall of the empire. Lacking courage 
in laziness. It caused them to suffer defeat in that empire to fall. Now the question that we must ask is this. Is the gospel armor too heavy? Is it too inconvenient for us? Are we using all the pieces of the armor that we need to be using, which is every bit of it? Are we earnestly contending for the faith? As Jude 3, verse, uh, as Jude 3 tells us, or are we apologizing for us, for it? Jude has one chapter, doesn't it? Jude 3. <laughs> Notice uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our for warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, our, as Christians, our mighty weapons are from God. And they should be used, as this tells us, in pulling down the, the uh, spiritual strongholds of Satan. We must attack, attack those strongholds of error and not just hold our own. We need to be attacking them and bringing them down. We do not need to let error survive. You know, when General MacArthur was called home from Korea, he reminded Congress that war's very objective is victory and not pro prolonged indecision. And I don't think we've learned that yet. And I think MacArthur was right. And you know, as sometimes as Christians, we need a course in enemy recognition. Sometimes we don't recognize the enemy sometimes. And that's understandable in some cases. Jesus declared in Matthew 12 and verse 30 that the man who is not with him is against him. And sometimes, we just don't recognize our spiritual enemies. We need to remember that the devil is, is, uh, does not normally attack us under his own banner. In fact, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And besides the obvious places, Satan could also be working on you through your best friend. Maybe the best friend doesn't even know he's working on you in that, in that way. He could be working on you through your coworker. He could be working on you through a fellow Christian who may not even know better, or even a teacher or a preacher who is teaching error in some form or fashion. And it could be that we have become our own worst enemy. You know, our best defense is putting on the whole armor of God using his word as our weapon. And otherwise, if we're indifferent to that, that's going to cause us to be defeated, just like Rome was defeated because they refused to use their weapons every day, and they refused to the, the training that, that they should have been doing. They got lazy. They got lazy. Confederate General Thomas J. Jackson was one of the commanders at the first battle of Bull Run. When both the right and left flanks of the Confederate Army fell backwards, retreated, Jackson's troop held firm. And General Bernard S.B. rallied his door, uh, disorganized men with these words. He said, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Now this meant that Jackson and his men were standing firm and they were prevailing in the heat of battle. And in the same manner, you know, Christians, we're engaged in a great spiritual war, warfare as well. Sometimes we think we're, we're waging war when all we might be doing is just making noise or, or just running around, really doing nothing, and sometimes in retreat. So our mission is to take a firm stand, to take a firm stand for God, to stand uh, firm with that armor of God uh, fully intact upon us. 
and to take on the advancing enemies of uh, Satan and stand for the truth and, and always prevail in that struggle. You know, you might be thinking, uh, uh, can I really make a difference? Can you, uh, can I as just one person, I'm just one person, can I really make a difference? I want you to, uh, to listen to some incredible numbers. We've, we've talked about this before. Incredible numbers which are based upon each Christian converting just one person to Christ each year and then each one of those converts being equally productive. And I'm going to show you that uh, I didn't do this by hand. I, I made an Excel spreadsheet, and I know you can't read it, but there's my Excel spreadsheet that shows exactly the numbers that I'm fixing to quote to you. Let's assume that you are the only Christian in the world. That's the one, the second column only Christian in the world, and you convert one person each year, and each convert conver converts one person each year. So after 20 years, you will have over 1 million Christians in 20 years, if you just do that. In other words, you're doubling <coughs> your population of Christians each year, and that's what that's showing. Let's now assume that uh, Tanner has 128 members. If we all convert one person each year, and each convert converts one person each year, we're going to convert the world's population of over 8 billion people to Christ in 26 years. And that's kind of what happened in the first century, wasn't it? They converted, I think, around 26, 27 years, it says the whole world had heard the gospel. Okay, let's assume that the churches of Christ in the USA have a total membership of one million people. And Google said that we had a, a uh, membership of 1.68 million. Now, if each Christian of the one million converted one person a year and so on, like we talked about, the world's population would be converted to Christ in 13 years. 13 years. So it does make a difference. We each, each one of us can make a difference. Um, we just need to be doing the mission that God has set for us to do, going to all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what we need to be doing. Any comments on that? Can you, can you read my Excel sheet? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I, I think we talked about this before. This, this won't take long either, I don't think. But what the armor of God looks like. What does it look like on the Christian? In Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, Paul talks about that armor. That thing we've been talking about for 11 weeks now. And really... We're, we're fighting the invisible forces of Satan, but our armor should be visible. It should be visible. Notice that uh, when we're fighting Satan, that even the people around us who see us in that battle, they need to be seeing that armor upon us. Now, let me tell you how that armor is visible. When people see an armored Christian, they see the belt of truth as we make decisions and make choices based on the word of God. They see that, they see what we're doing. They see the breastplate of righteousness as we strive to be Christ-like in all aspects of our life. They see the shoes of the gospel of peace when we speak about the wonderful salvation in Jesus, when we're fulfilling our mission. They see the shield of faith as we display our reliance on God and his promises. They see the helmet of salvation when we share our earnest expectation 
of a heavenly reward. And they see the sword of the Spirit when we use God's word as our authority and, re and refuse to be silent concerning its doctrine or its abuse. So the armor of God actually has a dual purpose. It allows the Christian to win our battles with Satan and it displays to those around us who we belong to. We belong to Christ our Lord. There's the other point that was a little bit longer. Daily maintenance of the armor of God. We need to be reading and studying the word, word of God. We need to be praying for divine enlightenment and understanding. We need to memorize the scripture. And as I get older, that's tougher. So at least remember and know where to go in the Bible to find those scriptures. At least do that. Meditate on the word of God. Share the word with others. And that's the things we need to do daily to maintain that armor of God. And I have one final comment. And that's from Revelations 22, verse 13. It says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And of course, this is Jesus. Jesus is saying this. But I think we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus my Alpha and Omega? Is he my beginning and end? Is, is he my first and last? That's a question we all need to ask ourselves and answer for ourselves. Thanks for a, for a good 11 weeks. I appreciate it.